Hey everyone, welcome to Renew Church Online. My name is Pastor Mikey, and I'm so happy that you chose to join us for this online service. I just wanna let you guys know that this is an interactive service, so feel free to comment down where you're watching this from and who you're watching it with, we would love to know. Also, I encourage you to fill out our Connect card, the link will pop up, and uh, I encourage you to do that because it gives us an opportunity to reach out to you to keep you in the loop of what's going on here at Renew Church. Also, I wanna encourage you to press that share button if you're watching on Facebook, let your friends and family know that Renew Church is doing online service right now. And after service, we have our Facebook Live that'll be hosted by Pastor Trevor. And it's just a time to hang out, fellowship, and uh, get to know one another. I wanna let you all know that our small groups have officially launched. Last week was our first week and they went great. We have a men's group, women's group, Tuesday group. We have so many different groups. I bet that there's a group out there for you. So check out our website, www.renew.miami and find which small group fits for you. Now I want to let you know that we have an upcoming serve day that's Saturday September the 26th and what we'll be doing is we're going to be meeting up at the drive-in church location. The address is right here and that's actually going to be the official new home of Renew Church and so what we're doing is we're going to paint the outside building. We're going to begin this process of making it our own and so I, I encourage you and I invite you to join us in, in being a part of something that is bigger than ourselves and so come and hang out with us again that's september the 26th food and refreshments will be provided uh, masks are required social distance will be enforced and you can come hang out with us that starts at 9 a.m also i want to let you know that today there is drive-in church at 5 p.m at the location that i had just previously mentioned so come hang out with us we'll be in our cars being able to worship and hear the word together and now i want to let you know that october the 4th we are planning doing our first in-person service and so more details are to come as we get closer to that date so be looking at our socials be looking at our emails and uh be looking forward to to that time and now here's pastor ricardo with the rest in just a few minutes we're going to receive our offerings something we do every weekend we gather for our church online i was thinking um this past week about working out do you ever think about working out some people go to the gym a place full of super healthy people and people who aren't healthy at all. 
Seriously, there are those people who go to the gym um, area who, who can't even put their arms straight down. And there are those people who are, who, who are out of breath just walking to the treadmill. But there's a big drift, difference between thinking about going to the gym and actually going to the gym. Think about working out doesn't really accomplish the end goal. You got to actually do it. Then again, you don't really end up at the gym without planning to go there. That's because planning and action are connected. It's the same way with giving. I guess that you're probably giving some, some, something spontaneously. You see a need or hear a story and you're moved to give. So you give based on whatever you have at that moment. And that's a good thing. But if you only give spontaneously, when you feel led, then you're really putting a limit on what you're able to do. Another way to think about it is to plan to give. In fact, the Bible actually encourages us to plan ahead when it comes to generosity. In the book of Genesis, Abraham thought ahead of time to send gifts with his servants for Isaac's future wife. In Chris, the Christmas story, the Magi planned ahead of time bring to bring extravagant gifts for God's son. You see, God strate uh, strategically showed his love for us, sending Christ while we were still sinning against him. Isaiah chapter 32 verse 8 says, But generous people plan to do what is generous, and they stand firm in their generosity. In 2 Corinthians chapter 9 verse 7 Paul encourages people in the church to decide in advance how much they want to give. So as, as we receive our offerings uh, this morning, my prayer is that you would, would pray and think and decide in advance how to participate. And there are two ways that we can give this morning. The first one is by going, is online, is by going to renew.miami slash forward giving. And the second way is through text, and the phone number should be below the screen. So let me pray with you uh, this morning. Heavenly Father, I pray that as we give a portion back to you, God, that we would just plan it out, God, and give back to you this morning. We love you, God, and we thank you for all that you do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. the world but it couldn't fill me man's empty praise treasures of faith are never enough and you came along and you put me back together and every desire now satisfied here in your love. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing. Nothing is better than you. Oh, I'm not
Hey, thank you so much for tuning in today, for being a part of our interactive service at Renew Church Online. My name is Pastor Trevor. Take just a moment, share where you're watching from, who you're watching with, um, even click that share button. If you're, if you're watching online through our church online or our Facebook uh, um, platform, just let somebody know uh, that you're watching Renew Church. And, and man, who knows what could happen. Maybe somebody will uh, hear a message that will speak to their heart minister to them. Thanks so much for being a part of this. Would you pray with me as we get into this message? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. 
God, thank you for your goodness, your grace, your mercy. God, thank you for everything that you do for us. Thank you for the gospel, God, that saves us, that sets us free, uh, that gives us hope for a future, oh God. And I just pray that in this message that you would be glorified, that you would speak to some hearts, and uh, just use me as your messenger. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we've been in a series for the last couple of weeks, and, and uh, we conclude it next week. But this week is, is week three of this series called Broken Gospel. We started with a message called What is the Gospel? Reminding you that the bad news reveals the good news. And then last week I talked a little bit about how good is good enough. And uh, th- this treadmill that sometimes we find ourselves on, the cycle of works of just trying to find our, uh, you know, acceptance, but getting there through achievement and uh, sustenance and significance. And, and then finally we then think we're accepted, but that's not the way grace is. The cycle of grace is the very opposite of that. It's uh, we're accepted and because we're accepted, we're significant and that significance uh, leads to our sustenance and uh, then that sustenance will um, help us to achieve some things that maybe we know that we want to do for God and for His kingdom. This week, I want to talk to you a little bit about something else. I want to talk to you about kind of a um, maybe a little bit of a controversial topic in, in, in uh, Christian circles and in our faith, but uh, I want to talk to you a little bit about the, the prosperity gospel. We talked last week about gospel treadmills and how you sometimes get on the treadmill and you go as hard as you can and you go nowhere in that. Today I want to talk to you about the gospel vending machine. And that's where uh, you sometimes try to get something from the gospel. You try to get something from God and, and you think that if you do certain things or if you, you know, press the right buttons, you pray the right prayer, sometimes things are just going to happen and they're just kind of fall into your lap. And, and I know that, that there's, there's verses that back some of the things that, that people might believe or, or, or think. Like, for example, Matthew chapter 21, Jesus, when he's there, he has this encounter uh, with a fig tree, and I feel bad for that fig tree, but uh, the fig tree wasn't producing any figs, and Jesus was hungry, and he cursed it, and uh, when the disciples passed back through that town, Matthew and Mark record this the very same way, but they're both like, in both of them, the disciples are like, Jesus, look what you did, and, 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 and that's amazing that you did that miracle, but you cursed the fig tree, and it didn't produce fruit, in fact, it died, and Jesus says, if you believe, you will receive whatever you ask for in prayer. I don't know how many of you are asking for dead fig trees, but that that was the, the context of that particular verse. I'm not trying to make light of it, but I just want you to know, like there are verses that, that, that sometimes we lean on and we, we pray and, and believe in, but sometimes they lead somewhere. Hang on before you tune out today. Hang on and let me just finish the rest of this uh, this point, this thought. Here's another one of the verses. Uh, a father brings his demon-possessed son and brings him to Jesus, and he says, If you can do anything, take pity on us. Help us if you can, said Jesus. And, and Jesus said, If you can? Like, everything is possible for the one who believes. And that's true, but that 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 sometimes leads to another point or another thought in the the the, the, the prosperity doctrine, which is this word of faith where you can just, if you believe it, it's going to happen. If you, if you believe it, you're going to receive it. If you name it, you claim it, it's, it's going to happen. And it, I hate to say it, but there are, there are verses that, that don't identify and that don't line up with that. Hebrews chapter 11, my, one of my favorite New Testament chapters. He starts in, in, in the writer starts with verse one, says, Faith is the evidence of things hoped for and the assurance of things not seen. Yeah, we can't see that. We can't see that those wealth or, or that health or we can't see the, those possessions or that new house or that new car. But that doesn't mean that that's what those patriarchs of the faith and those heroes of faith were really praying for and believing for. My concern is, is that when you take a passage or, or even several passages and you use them to say something that may contradict something else in scripture. My, my, my concern is, is that it could lead you down a wrong path. It could be a broken gospel. Here's one of my favorites. 
and I'm an advocate, I'm a preacher of it. It's Matthew chapter 6, 33. If you've been around me for any amount of time, you hear me talk about it. It says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all of these things will be added unto you as well. That's one of my favorite verses. It's, it is my father's favorite verse, and I grew up hearing him talk it and preach it and live it and everything that he did. Seek first the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added to you. But the very verses before that, verse 19 of chapter 6 says, Do not store up for yourselves treasure on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. Verse 24 says, No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and you will love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and you will despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. So I, I just, when I, when I get to the context of verse 33 and he's saying all of these things, I'm not sure that he's saying, if you seek first the kingdom of God, then all of a sudden a brand new boat's going to pull up in your driveway. Or all of a sudden every, you know, every uh, pair of shoes that you've ever wanted is going to show up in your closet. I just, I don't know that I can put my mind on that. One of the dangers in a broken gospel is to think if, if you do certain things related to your giving or having faith or prayer or asking God, that it's a mathematical equation. And it changes Jesus from Savior to Santa. But that's not who He is. He's greater than Santa. And no matter what it is that you want, He knows more. He knows better. Jesus knows what you need. You know what He wants from you? You know what He wants from me? He wants our hearts. That's the most important thing. I want to take us to the Old Testament. That's our primary text today. Old Testament chapter 20. In Exodus chapter 20, God gives Moses the Ten Commandments. And you know many of them. Don't murder, don't steal, don't commit adultery. The very first two commandments, though, they must be important. They must be a priority. The first one says, you shall have no other gods before me. And the second one says, you shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them for I, the Lord, your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the parents to the third and the fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love and keep my commandments. My, I, it, it's, it's as if those must be pretty important things that, that he would talk about the idol and then fastening or, or, or making this image that you would begin to worship. Those must be important for them to be the top two of the top ten. But all ten, they're pretty clear. That it's pretty like easy stuff to, to know and understand. But, but here's the thing. That's Exodus chapter 20. But in just a few chapters, just like a lot of us in life, we get off track. We start going our own way. We start to wander because that's what the Israelites did for 40 years in the wilderness. And, and, and we start thinking rules like commandments or were they suggestions? Do I really have to obey these verbatim, word for word? So, so here, here's what happens. During the 10 plagues, which is back at the beginning when, the, when uh, God is using Moses to deliver the Israelites out of Egypt, out of slavery, into the promised land. During the 10 plagues, the final one against the Egyptians was the, the, the plague of the Passover. The final one took the life of every firstborn child, born of those that had not been, that had not had a, the blood of a sacrificial lamb painted over their doorpost, covering their, their home. And so the Egyptians, including Pharaoh, including all of the livestock, it didn't matter who you were or what you were. If you were the firstborn and you didn't have the blood of the sacrificial lamb over your doorpost, you were done. That child was gone. So the Israelites knew and they, they took the blood of the lamb and they put, painted it over the doorposts. But everyone else, they didn't and they lost loved ones. They lost children, even the older. But if they were firstborn, they died. Exodus twelve thirty five says, Moses told them to tell their Egyptian masters to give up their gold, their silver, and their clothing. The text says that they plundered the Egyptians. They're given these gifts, gold, silver, clothes for their journey. God has hand-delivered to them, these slaves, 
money, you know, possessions, clothing, all the things that they might need to go from slavery into the promised land. Like they've seen God do miracles. They've seen what God can do. They've, they've seen God on the mountain. They've seen God in the pillar of smoke and, and, and the pillar of cloud and the pillar of fire. They, they've seen what God done, has done. They, they've heard clearly the rules of what to do and how to live in relationship with God and with man. But here we go, 12 chapters later, Exodus chapter 32. And the people are out in that desert. Moses is on the mountain getting the message from God, hearing from God. And it says in Exodus 32, I'm going to read rather a lengthy passage, Exodus 32, 1 through 20. When the people saw that Moses was so long in coming down from the mountain, they gathered around Aaron, that was one of his assistants, and they said, come, make us gods who will go before us. As for this fellow Moses who brought us up out of Egypt, we don't know what has happened to him. Aaron answered them, take off the gold earrings that your wives, your sons, and your daughters are wearing and bring them to me. So all the people, they took off their earrings and they brought them to Aaron. Where did that come from? We just talked about it. He took what they handed him and he made it into an idol cast in the shape of a calf, fashioning it with the tool. And then they said, these are your gods, Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. This, this, this gold is your God? Aaron saw this. He built an altar in front of the calf and he announced tomorrow there will be a festival to the Lord. So the next day the people rose, they burnt sacrificed burnt offerings and they presented fellowship offerings. Afterwards, they sat down to eat and drink and to indulge in revelry. Then the Lord said to Moses, go down because your people who brought, who you brought out of Egypt have become corrupt. They've been quick to turn away from what I commanded them and they have made themselves an idol cast in the shape of a calf. They bow down to it and they've sacrificed to it. And, and they said, these are your gods, Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. I've seen these people, the Lord said, and they're stiff necked. Now leave me alone so that my anger may burn against them and that I may destroy them. Then I will make you into a great nation. But Moses sought the favor of the Lord. Lord, he said, why should you burn? Why should your anger burn whom you brought out of Egypt? against your people whom you brought out of Egypt with great power and a mighty hand. Why should the Egyptians say it's with evil intent that he brought them out to kill them in the mountains and to wipe them off the face of the earth? Turn from your anger, relent, and do not bring disaster on your people. Remember servant, your servants Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, to whom you swore by your own self. I will make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and give your descendants all this land I promised them and it will be their inheritance forever. So the Lord relented and did not bring the peop- uh, bring on his people the disaster he had threatened. Moses turned. He went down the mountain with the two tablets of covenant in his hands, the, the, the Ten Commandments. They were inscribed on both sides, front and back. The tablets were the work of God. The writing was the writing of God engraved on the tablets. And when Joshua heard the noise of the people shouting, he said to Moses, There is the sound of war in the camp. Moses replied, it's not the sound of victory. It's the sound, it's not the sound of defeat. It is the sound of singing that I hear. When Moses approached the camp and he saw the calf and the dancing, his anger burned and he threw the tablets out of his hands, breaking them to pieces at the foot of the mountain. And he took the calf the people had made and he burned it in the fire. Then he ground it to powder, scattered it on the water, and he made the Israelites drink it. That that wasn't some kind of a vitamin drink. That wasn't a healthy thing. That wasn't a good thing. That wasn't prosperous. I don't know if you understand this, and, and, and if you read on from verse 20, Exodus 32 and beyond, this doesn't have a happy ending. It ends with lots of people dying for their sin and their disobedience. Man, what's my point today? What am I trying to say to you? Here's the problem with the gospel centered on prosperity and possessions. Your gold, it can become a God and you can start to worship it. And when you do, then you say, this is what saved me. It's because I got this. It's because, oh, thank God I got that final, that, that final payment or that, that, 
pay raise or that extra income or that new job. And it can become a God that you think has saved you. Listen, there's nothing wrong with acquiring wealth. But this idea that the atonement, that grace, that, that what Jesus did, it, that, that grace extends to the sin of being poor, man, that's wrong. That's wrong. That's, there, there's, there's not grace for that because it's not wrong. And I've found some of the happiest, most faith-filled people, God-fearing followers of Christ, maybe not the richest financially, but spiritually, emotionally, physically, in so many other ways, man, they're the happiest, they're the wealthiest, they're living the best lives. It's not a sin to be poor. But some of the, the greatest followers of Christ are, are poor, and, and it's not always because they're ignorant with their money, but because of the circumstances that they find themselves in. My grandmother died earlier this year. And if I'm honest, I thank God that she passed away when she did before COVID hit because it, it, it allowed for some 60 of her grands and her great grands. And she even had great, great grands at this funeral. If it was just a couple of months later, we wouldn't have been able to celebrate like that and celebrate this woman of God that, that, that uh, served so faithfully. She was in her 90s when she passed away, and some 40 years ago, her husband died. He died in, a, in, in an explosion, in a, in a boiler, in a, um, in a hospital. And so from that time on, ever since I've known her, up until just those very last few years when she ended up uh, living in a nursing home, she always worked. Like, that's just what she did. That's how she lived. That's how she made ends meet. My grandmother made most of her own clothes. She never would eat out. She hated eating out. She thought it was a waste of money. She'd give me $5 when I mowed the grass. And uh, every birthday that she remembered, I'd get a $5 bill. Like, uh, she drove this ugly 1972 blue four-door Ford car. I can't even think of the name of this thing, man, but I can just picture it there in her driveway. And she drove it up until the mid 90s when she upgraded. Uh, right, right before that, she had it painted it herself. She, she loved blue and she loved spray paint. She just made that thing uh, shine, I guess. Uh, I mean, she, she put that blue all over everything, the bumper. It didn't matter what it was. But my grandmother, she loved her car. She loved her possessions. She finally made the upgrade, and she got a, a 1992 Geo Metro. It was also blue. And she drove this thing till she couldn't drive any longer just a few years ago. This, this, this Geo Metro, like, it, this was cool. This was in with the hybrids before hybrids were even in. Like, it ran on one cylinder and momentum. You had to kind of, like, make that thing move because it was so terribly slow. But my grandmother wanted for nothing. And my grandmother was happy. I'm trying to give you this point that my, my grandmother didn't live in sin because she was a poor lady. And, and I'm not also saying on the opposite side of the spectrum that there's anything wrong with acquiring and having wealth and being comfortable. But when that wealth or that desire for that wealth, when it has you, man, you've got to watch out. I would say there's also nothing wrong with depending on God for everything you have. There's nothing wrong with being in that place where you have to just trust God for your very next meal, for where you're going to stay and how you're going to live. Because there are millions of people on our planet that love God and serve Jesus faithfully, and they do just that. John Piper says, Be beware of a gospel that is absent of the doctrine of suffering, of self-denial, of serious exposition of Scripture. And beware of a gospel that is prominent, makes prominent self and marginalizes God. I want to warn you, God is not a vending machine. And your Savior isn't 
Santa. Here's what God wants more than anything else for us. God wants your heart. And if your heart is in your pocket, then He wants that also. See, for that rich young ruler that asked, how do I inherit eternal life? He said, I've done it all. I've obeyed all the commandments. I know everything that I'm supposed to do and I've done them all. And then Jesus says, well then, give me your heart. Sell everything you have and come and follow me. You know what happened to that young man? He left with full pockets and a broken heart because he had a broken gospel and he wasn't willing to give it up. And let me say it again. Before I get emails, before people say things wrong or, or, or put things you know out of context, there's nothing wrong with having possessions. But when your possessions have you, that's when you have to watch out. That's when you're going down the wrong road. Today, I don't know where you're at. I don't know where your struggle is. All I can imagine is that for these Israelites, that if they would have just held on a little bit longer, if they would have trusted the God that gave them the gold and the silver and the, the clothes out of Egypt, if they would have uh, believed for the God and not said that it's the this stuff that is the God, man, their generation would have continued and their legacy would have continued. And I hope and I pray that you won't follow that path. I hope and I pray that whether whether you're rich or poor, no matter where you find yourself on that spectrum, that you'll trust God with your possessions. But that you don't won't turn that into what, what you're worshiping and that, that you turn that into what you're following after and, and why you're serving God. It's my desire in my heart that you'll be able to follow God because, man, like my grandmother, she may not have had very much on this earth, but in her heart and in heaven, man, she had everything. Today can be a day for you. It could be a day of turning. It could be a day of repentance. And, and I'm talking to everybody today. I'm talking to myself. Repentance doesn't mean, oh, uh, it doesn't always mean, oh, I'm, I'm uh, so far from God that I, um, you know, I, I don't even know who Jesus is or I don't know about the gospel. I don't know about, uh, you know, his, Jesus, God's only son that died. Repentance is a turning. Repentance is, is a, 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 a realizing that, hey, I'm, I'm going the wrong way and doing a complete 180 to go back the other direction. And so maybe for somebody today within the sound of my voice that's watching this, it's for you, it's, it's a message that says, I need to turn. I need to turn from this attitude, this heart, this yearning or desire for these things. And I need to let go of the things that God is calling me to let go of. And what we try to do at Renew Church in our leadership and, and in ministry, we try to lead with an open hand. We try to say, this is the way that God has blessed us. This is the way that God has provided for us. And in the same way, instead of hanging on to it, whether it's resources or people, time or talent or whatever it is, we're trying to say, God, use it however you want to use it. And that's the same heart that you've got to have with everything that you have. Don't be selfish with your time. Don't be selfish with your talents. Don't be selfish with your resources because it's those things that you're going to chase after that are going to become a, a God for you that, and it'll take you down a wrong path. Pretty soon, what's enough today is not enough tomorrow. And what's enough tomorrow is not enough the next day. And you're just seeking for more and more and more. Today can be a day to turn from that. Today can be a day to change your heart and say, God, I surrender all. When we declare Jesus as Lord, we're saying, Jesus, you're in control. Jesus, you're the boss. I'm giving my life into your hands, my family, my home, my finances, my future. I'm putting it in your hands. I trust you with the outcome. I'm not praying and saying you've got to, demanding, making demands. I'm not saying, God, you've got to give me certain things because I believe and I receive. 
Instead, I'm trusting in God. I'm having faith in the God that's over all things and even the outcomes. Maybe today you're that person that hasn't heard the gospel or or you've been far from God for far too long. And this message is spoken to you and you said, you know what, I need to take the very first step. If that's you today, why not make that declaration to ask Jesus Christ to be the Lord of your life, to save you, to forgive you of your sins, and to set you free? Would you pray with me? Gracious Heavenly Father, God, I thank you for this day. God, I thank you for this opportunity that we have to hear from you, from your word, and just to think about our lives, to think about where we are, and and, uh, God, what we're seeking you for today. God, I pray for that person that may have been trying to please you for the wrong reasons, or may have been trying to earn uh, blessings, but there's nothing wrong with with blessing, but sometimes sometimes monetary things aren't blessings. God, I don't know where these people are. I don't know where the, 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 that one person that's listening right now is. But I ask that you'd help them. That you'd minister to their heart. That you'd guide them. Lord, if there's sin in their life, that they would just be able to surrender it to you and ask you to forgive them. Just say, Lord Jesus, forgive me. Come into my life. Today I declare you as my Lord and my Savior. Thank you for dying on the cross. Because you died for me, I choose to live for you. I want to be a new creation in Christ. Help me to follow you and to daily surrender everything that I have over to you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And guys, thank you so much for tuning in. Thank you for being a part of week three of this series, Broken Gospel. I hope that it's been a blessing and an encouragement to you. Um, If there's anything we can do for you, you let us know, but we want to be able to help you in your walk with God and in your, your next steps. There's lots of ways to get involved in the life of the church. We've got some great things coming, including in-person services starting October the 4th. We're going to have services at 930, 1045. I'd love to see you. I'd love to meet you in person or meet you on Zoom, however we could do that. But let's let's connect. Even, uh, you know, check check us out on our Facebook and on our website and on our Instagram. God bless you. Have a great week. Thanks.